All right, we're going to start our topic today of IUPAC nomenclature. We're going to go over our full set of rules. Um, no, I mean, okay, so we can name not only just the alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes, but also some alcohols and even some amines. So we're going to go a little bit more in depth than maybe our textbook does. All right, but we are going to start very similar to every textbook to does this and we're going to cover our alkanes first. Now alkanes are just simply things with just nothing but carbons and hydrogens and our general formula for an alkane for every one carbon there's twice that plus two hydrogens and that'll be for any straight chain. Now the four here are um, the simplest ones and I have not only the name on that left column I have it kind of looks like a Lewis structure we're going to see in organic chem we don't completely do Lewis structures with like the lone pairs of electrons always. So we, you'll see them called different things. Um, here they're listed as calculate structures. Sometimes they're just gonna be line drawings. Um, next to that is condensed structures. Some of these will be a little bit more drawn out like you'll often see where they'll actually draw the carbon-carbon bonds. They will condense the hydrogens on there and um, keep it simple I guess that way. Um, and then next to that we have their ball and stick models. Now these four got their names from um, um, how they were first discovered. Uh, uh, butane came from the fact that the uh, simplest four carbon molecule that was easily isolated or earliest isolated came from butter. All right, but after that they start to make sense. So five carbons with 12 hydrogens is actually pentane. Uh, six carbons with 14 hydrogens is hexane. And they go on up there. We have heptane, octane, nonane, decane. They just keep uh, using numerical prefixes in front of that. Now all that does is tell us the number of carbons in the, sh in the straight chain. It's not always the name. Now it is the name when they're nice perfectly in a straight chain. Sometimes you'll see this with the letter N out in front of these to let you know that they are straight chained. But things like um, butane, for instance, can be put together differently. So can pentane and hexane. And that was what we're looking at here next. So we have what we consider constitutional isomers. So both of these guys um, have a molecular formula with uh, four carbons and ten hydrogens. And all of these on this side five carbons with 12 hydrogens and I just have the, the different ways you can range it. For C4H10 there are only two ways. We can put them all in a straight row or we can rip off one of those and put it in the middle. Now I have the condensed structure. I also have the skeletal arrangement. Skeletal arrangements are just showing the carbon-carbon bonds. Nothing's actually labeled but you could always figure out how many hydrogens there are because carbon likes to make four bonds. Now these condensed structures can be a little bit odd. So CH3, 3, that is these guys. I have a CH3 here. I have a CH3 here. And I have a CH3 there. And then this guy actually has a single hydrogen on it. And they're all connected to that single location. And that's very similar to this one on my C5H12. I have th uh, four CH3s. Right there, right there, right there, right there, all bonded to a single carbon. All right. To put this into play, we're going to try to create all five of our structures for C6H14. We're going to do condensed structures, and then we're also going to do skeletal. All right, so I'm going to do the easiest one for both those, and that is, or for this one, that is putting the six carbons in a row. And if I want to do the skeletal, that is just going to be five lines. And both of these are just called hexane. And properly with a little lowercase n in front of you, in front of it, tell you it's a nice straight line. All right. All the other four are derivatives of this, where we're just going to pull stuff off of there. So what I mean by pulling stuff off, I'm going to pull that single CH3 off the end and I'll start by putting it on the second location. Just 
So we pulled an H off here, put it on that location, put the CH3 there. And skeletal for that looks something like this. I'll have my five zigzags and I just have a second one off the end. Now I could also take that CH3 and put it on that location. Given a skeletal, that's going to look something like so. Now, interesting, I can't do any other locations. Like, if I put that CH3 here, it'd be the exact same structure, just backwards. And if I put it off the N location, it'd be back to just being N hexane. Because our uh, backbone gets longer in that case. All right, so that's the only ones I can do with a single methyl off of it. So my next ones I'm going to do is I'm going to take two of those off. And I'll put them on the two middle locations. And get something skeletal, look something like that. And then our last one, instead of doing both of those onto uh, uh, each of those locations, I'm going to put them both on one. So CH3, then this is just a C, and both of those CH3s come off it. And we have a skeletal with four carbons, but two on that location. All right, just to get a little bit more practice with this, we're going to do all nine that have C6H16. Now, I know I'm going to have space issues, so I'm going to try to do this without having to erase anything. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then my skeletal. Two, three, four, five, six, two, four, six, seven. That's seven. And both of those are just going to be heptane. All right. I'm going to have to start writing a little bit smaller. So my next group, I'm going to take six. And I'll start by putting the seventh one right there. Actually, I'm going to make this higher up. And I'll do another one of these. I'm going to put that on that next location. And I really don't have any other locations for that one, so I'm going to, let's see, six in a row with that, and then six in a row there. And I don't have any other way to do six in a row with a single branch because they'd start duplicating. Might be off the second location or the third location, and that's that's all my options. All right, so now five in a row, and I'll put second one here and a third one here. Or, leave that one there, and put number seven here. Or, I'll have to do this over here, make this just a carbon with a CH3 and a CH3. Also have 
I could put those two in the middle. And I see no more ways to do a pair of a lot of the pair like that, but I could do still with five in a row. I'm gonna call this a CH. And I'll put both of them together. And then I'm going to have one, or I'm just going to have four in a row. Have the fifth one there, the sixth one there, and the seventh branch there. Yeah, what a mess of things on this page. But, five in a row, there and there, five in a row, here and here, five in a row, both that location, five in a row, both this location, five in a row, both there, and then four, giving us all nine of our structures. All right, now, interesting enough, what we're leading up to on the, these is to point out that I was able to show you the name of just the one, in heptane or in hexane. The rest aren't as easy because while they do have, like everything on here has six carbons that's derivative of hexanes or an isomer of hexane, and everything here is an isomer of heptane, we're clearly not going to call them all heptane. So what we're going to introduce now is how we go about doing our names. We're going to introduce the full IUPAC nomenclature rules. Now this... Um, Phrase down here, locant, prefix, parent, suffix, that is all the parts of the name. Um, I do have this because locant is going to be a number and we're going to separate our numbers from our words with dashes. All right, but we're going to define what each one of these little parts is. Now, we've kind of done these two parts already. When we actually um, did have something like um, that hexane, The, pre, the parent is the hex, because it's telling you that you have six carbons in a row. And the suffix for all alkanes, which is nothing but carbons and hydrogens, all single bonds, is an E and E. So this is properly called just hexane because it has everything covered. So that actually is our very first rule that we're always gonna have on any of these. The very first thing we're always gonna do is just find the longest continuous chain of carbons. So like on this, I do start at something like in the middle where there's like a CH with a few things and I just go the longest path off each side. And I'll just go up over here. And on this one, I do think that's longer than this bottom one, and this side is longer. So I have my longest paths. Now that is the parent part of it. Um, and that does actually mean that uh, if we were to count these, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, this has a parent of octane. And this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight also has a parent of octane. Now the difference is, these guys are added to it. We're going to have to do something with those, but right now we're just focusing on the parent. 
Now I do have this condensed structure over here. I want to give an idea of how we go about doing these. So what I typically recommend is we're just going to expand it into a little bit more drawn out Lewis structure. So we're kind of going to get rid of all these parentheses. So these three CH3s, I'm going to have them come off that carbon there next to. So we're saying these CH3s are the ones I just drew. That looks like a two. And this is that carbon, which is connected to a CH2, which is connected to a C that has two CH3s off of it. And that is connected to a CH2 and a CH3. Once we've expanded that, finding our parent or the backbone is a piece of cake. Now, all these things I've circled are what we're going to call substituents. And it turns out identifying our substituents is our next rule. So identifying all those names, that is the prefixes. Now, when it is just nothing but uh, carbons, these are alkyl side chains. The ALK is like the prefix talking about the um, number of carbons, kind of like the parent. And the YL tells you it's a branch. So since that is just one, it's not methane anymore, it's methyl. Methyl. Since this is two carbons, we say ethyl. Now it happens with halogens as well. They have their own little prefix. We have chloros and bromos. And all we're going to do is have these come off of the branch, off that main chain. Now we do have some weird ones that pop up. Uh, a little bit more complex, and I actually have these drawn differently too. So like these, I have this little hash to say they're connected to a, a longer molecule. On this one, I have R, which is another way we actually show this in the um, chemistry world that it's actually on multiple things. All right, so I have this connected, um, uh, and it is just three carbons. We're just gonna call this the propyl group because it's three carbons. Now, it's proper to put a little N in front of it tell you it's perfectly straight chain, which is why this is also in butane or butyl. Now, the other ones are isomers of that. So my next one here, that is a propyl, because it's got the three carbons, but we're connected in the middle. So it has a totally different name. It is actually isopropyl. So we introduced that idea of isomers. This has the iso in there. Now, I can't call all of the bottom ones isobutyl. They have a different class of names going on. I'm going to start with the last two. because so I want you to notice this location that we're connected to. That is a carbon. That carbon is connected to uh, this carbon and this carbon. It's connected to two carbons we would consider that secondary. This one here that the R is connected to is connected to one, two, three carbons. We would call that tertiary because it's connected to three things. All right, the secondary we're going to call sec butyl. And the one that's tertiary, we're going to call it tert butyl. And this one because it's not secondary or tertiary. This carbon is connected to this one to be primary. Um, we actually end up do getting to call this one isobutyl. All right, so putting them together, we had these things that we had highlighted already. Um, we would identify our substituents. This is a propyl. This is an ethyl, and all these guys are methyls. All right. Our last step is to put all these things together. So we got to figure out now our locant or where they're located. Now, what we're going to do is actually we have a number of rules that pop up here. They're typically catching. Um, uh, when there's ties. That's what these little sub things are. But we are just going to try to do on the ones we had lowest possible numbers. So if I back up here, what that means is we are going to number our carbons in our backbone. 
and we could have either side be our number one location. That could be the one carbon or this one is their one carbon. But what we want is we want to have that branch, the propyl, with the lowest possible number. So we could do one, two, three, four, or we'd be one, two, three, four, five. Four is better. It's a lower number. So that is how we're going to number that particular molecule. On our next one, we'd have one, two, three, four, or we could have one, two, three, four, five. Four is better again, so we're numbering on this side. Now, even on this one, we have a lot of branches, but we have one, two, or we would have been one, two, three. Since two is a smaller number, we're going to number from the left. All right. Now that we have the locant, the location of our branches, we have all of our branches, we know our backbone, and we know our suffix, we're able to name this thing. So we're going to say where that propyl is on this first one for propyl because it's on the fourth position. It's a propyl group and it's on an octane. For propyl octane. Our next one doesn't really look like the same molecule, yet the only thing that's really different is it's one carbon fewer. It's now an ethyl on that four position, but it is still octane. Now our last one's kind of interesting. All of those circled substituents are the same thing. They're all methyls. There's four of them. We're going to say where every single one of them are. So I have a two, I have a two, I have a four, and a four. Because that's where they are. There's one at two, this one's at two, this one's at four, this one's at four. And we have another weird thing. I'm going to do a dash. To say that there's four, we're going to have a prefix on a prefix, it's a numerical prefix or something that tells you how many there are, or a multiplier. Tetra for four, methyl, and then our backbone, hexane. So we have, in all three of these, we have the locant, that's our number. We have a prefix that is the name of the substituent, and we have a parent, that's how many carbons are in the backbone, and we have our suffix, which is telling you these are just carbon, carbon single bonds. All right, now this worked out pretty well because it did follow just this number it so our name contains the lowest possible numbers, the main rule when we number it. But we have all these things that pop up when there are ties. And we're gonna do a few molecules where there are ties. All right, so what I mean by ties, we're going to actually see that sometimes we have more than one way to actually number it or we have more than one way to find our things. So what we're going to do here is just to practice this, we're going to find our main backbone. Now I'm going to do this the same way I always do. I start with one of these branches and I avoid the short path. So this is definitely a longer path. So is this and then here I could go over there. All right, so on this one I have two substituents. We've got our first two rules. Now we're going to number our backbone. If we start on the right, we have one, two, three before we get to branch. On the left, one, two, three, four. Three is a better number, so I'm numbering from this end. Okay. Now, having that there, we can actually fully name this thing. Now, when we actually name it, when there's two substituents, I have a methyl here and I have an ethyl here, we're going to list our prefixes in alphabetical order. Multiple prefixes, you list them in alphabetical order. So, this is going to be uh, fully named. It's 
5 ethyl because ethyl comes before methyl. E is before M. And then we have 3 methyl octane. All right, that introduces this whole idea of alphabetical order. Well, remember when we had these guys up and we named them? Well, they have a weird thing that pops up on these. We called this one n-propyl. Called this one isopropyl. Call this n-butyl. This one was isobutyl. We had secbutyl. And we had tert butyl. All right, alphabetizing is kind of odd. On both of our first ones, the N is not always there. These almost always get alphabetized, or they actually get properly alphabetized with that B. The iso ones get properly alphabetized by the I. All right, but the other two, the sec butyl and tert butyl, since that secondary is kind of telling you this position was secondary, and this position was tertiary, we don't alphabetize by the sec and the T, or the S and the T, we alphabetize by the B. So they're alphabetized by that first letter. And we have another weird thing. Now it didn't pop up on our example, but tetra on this 2244 tetramethyl hexane, the tetra is telling you a uh, multiplier for the um, Substituent. The substituent is what we alphabetize. So on that one, you would have alphabetized by that M. You would have ignored that T comes after M. Now we're going to see some of that on some of our other examples. So we're going to do a few of these that create some problems with either how we number it or how we end up naming it. All right, so just various different practice problems coming up now. All right, so this one is kind of an interesting little dilemma in the sense of when we go to number a backbone, we're going to see that we have more than one choice. I'm going to have my backbone do that. Giving me three substituents. They're all methyls. So this is a trimethyl pentane because I got five carbons in that backbone. And I need to number this thing. But this is a weird tie. I have one, two, or I have one, two. I have two low number twos. Right. One of the first tiebreakers we're going to introduce now is the fact that if I have a tie like that, I look at the next substituent. There's two on that location. That wins the tie. So when there's a tie, we look at the next substituent and we get it to have the lowest possible number as well. So this thing is going to be named two two, four, trimethyl, pentane. All right, another one that's going to give us a tie. All right, let's find that backbone. Uh, I definitely like that path. I'll go across, down, down, and here it won't matter. I'll just go up here because it would have been the same either path. So I have methyls and an ethyl. All right, I kind of have the same problem as that previous one. One, two, three, I have a branch. One, two, three, I have a branch. So my tiebreaker will be the next branch, which is going to be that one, and I'll put it at four. So my numbering is going to go one, two, three, Four, five, six, seven, eight. This the third or the next branch broke my tie. Alright, so full name I have ethyl first because of alphabetic order. So six ethyl three four dimethyl di for two octane. Okay, on my next one, I have an interesting dilemma here. If I number from the top, I'd have uh, one, two 
three, four. If I numbered from the bottom, I'd have one, two, three, four. So our both of our substituents are either one's at either two or the other one's at two. And then the third one is the next location. So when there's ties where the numbers can't get a lower number, it's always two, three, we're gonna put our two on the one that is gonna come first alphabetically. So since bromo is alphabetically before chlorine, we're going to number from the bottom. Two substituents. One, two, three, four. Two because bromo comes before chloro. Giving us two bromo, three chloro, butane. All right, I got this crazy thing now. Did another one of these where I actually did a nice straight line uh, condensed structure. So our first thing we're gonna do is turn that into a little bit more useful drawing. I'm gonna add the CH bonds. This CH, the CH2, CH3 must be attached to it. And the CH2 must be attached to that CH. This CH has a CH3 on it. And then we have a CH2, CH3. Oh, that works out kind of nice now. All right, from here, I'm going to go straight across. Then at the left, I could go up and with that, or I could go over here. So I'm going to do that because it puts both of my substituents off that main straight line. All right, so I have an ethyl group and I have a methyl. Either one are going to be at three or five, and since ethyl comes first alphabetically, I'm gonna number this one from the left. Giving us three ethyl, five methyl, heptane. Okay, our prefixes have another group of issues that we have to look at now. It's what we're going to call complex substituents. So I want you to notice on this thing, that longest continuous chain of carbons is most definitely the 9 along the bottom. It actually means that this other group is a substituent. But that doesn't look like anything. It's kind of got three carbons with branches off of it. So it's, it's a substituted sub, su substituent. Fortunately, we have nice little rules to name a substituted substituent. So that circled thing is a complex substituent. Now how we're going to name it, we're going to actually do a second set of numbers on this. So we have the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 nine for the no name for the actual pre parent but this thing's going to get its own set of numbers now fortunately we don't have to worry about where to start you're going to start numbering the second one always at the same location right where it's branched and we're going to come up with the longest possible path from there so if i call that one this would be two because it's longer and then i could make that three now what that's going to mean is this Meth that carbon and that carbon are substituents off of the substituent. My blue thing, the, the substituent, is properly called, where's my pen? Here it is, 1,2-dimethylpropyl. So the YL and YL tell you they're both substituents, so substituent off of substituent. Now put this in the full name, not just this, the isolation, we're going to say it's on the five location, and we're going to put that complex substituent name in brackets. No name. All right, now, something else on this one. Kind of weird. If I have more than one branch, so another substituent, so if I put a, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put a, a methyl here. 
when we alphabetize our complex substituent, you always alphabetize it by the very first letter that's in the name. So even though that die is a multiplier prefix, if it's part of a complex substituent, it counts. So if I do add that methyl and that three location, that's just gonna go here at the after that because D comes alphabetically before M. So we're gonna do a few practice with complex substituents. And this is the type of thing that I would give you on a, on a test question myself. Um, rather than actually drawing out a molecule that forces you to possibly look for a different path, I'm going to give you a branch and tell you it is a complex substituent and I want you to name it. All right, so we're branched here at the R. So if I were to number things, I would be numbering my backbone as one because that's where it's branched. And then two and three is my Beth path. So these guys are substituents. I have a chloro and a methyl. So my complex substituent name is 2-chloro, 1-methyl, propyl. And then to get it perfectly right, we put it in brackets because that's how it would be in the name of something. And if we were to alphabetize it, this one would be alphabetized as starting with a C. All right, got another one of these. There's where we're branched. So our numbers are one, two, three, four, five, with branches here and here. So I have a one, two, dimethyl, pentyl as a complex substituent and I'd be alphabetizing this one at the with a D. Now our final one of these. Went a little bit longer with it, but we're still following the same rules. This is where we're branched, so that's my carbon number one, and this is my longest path. Making this guy and this guy a substituent. So have an ethyl and a methyl. I'll put ethyl first. butyl, and then parentheses, and you'd alphabetize by the E. All right, first change we're going to introduce to our rules is when we actually make our alkanes form rings. Now, only thing we're really doing at first is adding the word cyclo, or the prefix cyclo, to it. And that prefix is telling you that you are in an actual ring. Now what's kind of interesting about the ring, we might have things come off of it. That will change how we number our backbone because being a ring, there is definitely not a starting point. You get to choose where you start. Now it can be kind of simple. On a single substituent, we're just going to name what that substituent is. and add it as a substituent to the ring. So methyl on top of a cyclopentane gives you methyl cyclopentane. Ethyl in front of a cyclohexane gives you ethyl cyclohexane. And you don't need a number because it's implied that this is the number one location. It's unnecessary to say that. On my next one, I have an interesting dilemma. It turns out my longest backbone is the pentane. So it would be best to consider this a substituent. So because of that, we've taken the cyclobutane, dropped the suffix, and turned it into a cyclobutyl. And then we just numbered the backbone, just like we introduced. So we gave it the lowest possible number, which is one, giving you one cyclobutyl pentane. All right, this dilemma creates an interesting little issue that can pop up. Now, all I'm gonna do on this next slide is I took those five and I put a five-membered ring. Now we have a situation where either the ring is the backbone or the chain is the backbone. Now, the neat thing is you get to choose. So if I come up here and just, I'm going to draw it a second time. 
we actually have two legitimate ways to name it. That can be our backbone, or this can be our backbone. Leaving us with this guy as a substituent, <coughs> or that as a substituent. Now, if we have the ring as a substituent, we have to number a backbone. And we have to use that number when we name it because the alkane is our backbone. So this is a 1-cyclopentyl pentane. But if the ring is our backbone, we don't have to uh, identify where it's at. This is just pentyl cyclopentane because the one's implied there. Now, reason it's implied, why don't you look at the very next one? I just moved the methyl, or the ring over. Now, that does something interesting. This is most definitely a better backbone right now. And why is it a better backbone? Because if this is the backbone, uh, the line becomes a complex substituent. So, if I just call this 2 cyclo pentyl pentane I'm done but if I try to do it the other way around and said my cyclo pentane is the backbone this is one of these complex substituents one two three four with a substituent so we have a weird name if we do it that way of Aptabra brackets one methyl butyl cyclo pentane. I have another weird thing. If we do that, since it is a complex substituent, we always have to say where the complex substituent is. Oh, it kind of follows the rules, but we actually do have a rule that prevents this. So since this backbone is long enough to make the molecule a, a just a pentane. We should use that. We should avoid using complex substituents unless we have to. So technically, this is kind of wrong for this molecule because there is a way to name it without a complex substituent. Now that rule kind of applies to the next one. So technically, the cyclohexane is the biggest backbone. But if that's my backbone, this other thing is a complex substituent. We can, we're perfectly allowed to say that the pentane is the backbone. Because it turns this single thing into a simple substituent. Giving us three cyclohexol pentane. No complex substituent needed. We just didn't actually truly really have the longest continuous chain of carbons as our backbone. But that's okay. We're allowed to do that. All right. Next thing we're going to do, add two things off of a ring. Now, fortunately, this is actually kind of a simple little rule. When there's two, um, it could be the situation where they're both on one. I didn't do that on this slide, but that actually, I'll do a pentane. Ooh, that's a terrible looking pentane. I'm going to do cyclohexane because I can draw hexagons better. And I'll put two methyls right there. All right. They are both at the one location. They'd be defined that way. But since there are two, we can't imply one anymore, so we would specify it. And if they were different, so if one was a methyl and one was an ethyl, you'd say one ethyl, one methyl, then cyclohexane, which is what's going on up here. We have our two. One of them's going to be at one, one's going to be at two. One's at one, one's at three, one's at one, one's at three. And we're going to decide which one is first based on the alphabet. So since we have a methyl and a propyl, there's that pen, methyl and a propyl, M comes alphabetically first. On that middle one, we had a methyl and an ethyl. Ethyl comes first. And they're both methyls, so it doesn't matter. So alphabetical order breaks the tie.
because it do, the direction or the numbers wouldn't matter left or right. All right. When there's three substitu substituents, often we just do with the shortest possible path. So on my first one, I have two at the number at one of these locations and one at the other. We're just going to make sure that the one with two gets the lowest number. On our other one, one, two, three, four is the shortest possible path, so that's how we'd have to give it. Doesn't matter what the substituents are. So I didn't even look at the substituents on any of these, I looked at the numbers of them where they're at. But that does make this one turn into one, one, two, trimethyl cyclopentane. And on this one I have a methyl, I have an ethyl, and I have a propyl. So, alphabetically, 2-ethyl, 1-methyl, 4-propyl, cyclohexane. All right, one more way we're going to see when we have more than two things on there might sometimes have three where the pattern you could number it would be reversible. What I mean by that, our numbers are definitely one, two, three, but they could be one, two, three. I have two different ways I can do one, two, three here. So what we're going to do is look at our two potential ones. I have a bromo and I have a methyl. Bromo comes first, one, two, three. On this one, it's ethyl and methyl. Ethyl comes, excuse me, comes first, so it is number one. Now you notice I never actually cared about the chloro when I figured out the alphabetical order. That's because it'd be at the number two location on both these no matter what. Alright, so full name of this first one, one bromo, two chloro, three methyl, cyclo, Pentane. And our next one, we have 2 chloro, 1 ethyl, 3 methyl, cyclopentane. Not a space, that's close enough. All right. Got a few where we're just going to practice this stuff. And I've done a few, I've done at least one of these where I've given you a condensed structure. The very first thing we're going to do is turn it into a more drawn out structure. So a better Lewis structure. Or Lewis like. Or expanded condensed structure, however we want to call it. Let's see, CH3, CH3, this C is that C, it has two CH3s, one, two. The CH has a CH2, CH3 coming off of it, and it's connected to this CH2, which is connected to this CH2, which is connected to a CH that has a CH3 and a CH3. Yes, I got it. All right, my backbone. I'm going to do this, and I could go up in two, or I could go straight across. The reason I'm doing that is it gives me more branches, so more substituents. That's typically your safe bet, and that is kind of the rule. If you have two pathways, take the one that gives you more branches. Alright, numbering this one, I am definitely starting from the left, because I get two and I have two substituents. On this side, if I went one, two, I'd only have one substituent. And our substituents, we have ethyls and we have methyls. Oh, my full name, 3-ethyl, 2-2-6, oops, that's a, con that's a dash, 2-2-6, trimethyl heptane. All right. 
another one of these. All right, my backbone definitely going through these. Methyl is definitely too short, and these won't matter. I'm gonna go there. This side, I have an ethyl or an ethyl. I'm going straight down. Give them this is a substituent, that's a substituent, this is a substituent, this is a substituent. Oh, this is an interesting case. I have one, two, three, or one, two, three, and then both of them, all, all of them will be two, three, four, five, six, seven, or two, three, and six, seven. All right, so I have ties, both directions a tie. But my three location, I'd either have as an ethyl or a methyl. Ethyl comes first. So alphabet pops into this one on our numbering. So my full name, ethyl comes first. Three ethyl. Two six seven trimethyl octane all right got another one of these big things That must be my backbone. On this side, I'm going to go up because it is two carbons, but it gives me more branches. On this side, I could go there. No, this is better up here. All right, so substituent-wise, I have an ethyl, I have a pair of methyls there. I have another methyl, and I have an ethyl. All right, but numbering is actually relatively straightforward. If I numbered the other way, I would have got to three before I got to my first substituent. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right. And I have ethyls and methyls. So full name, I have a three, seven, diethyl, a two, two, eight, trimethyl, decane. Ooh, big molecule. Okay. Oh, a ring with multiple groups. Well, that's going to make that my one location, that my two location. I have methyls and ethyls off of a cyclobutane. So I have one, one diethyl. 2 methyl cyclobutane. All right. I have a cyc cyclopentane with 1 and 3 for my substituents. I have an ethyl and a propyl. One, two, three. Because alphabetic order breaks that directional tie. Given my one ethyl, three propyl, cyclopentane. On my next one. I'm going to expand this guy because that overly condensed structure is going to expand into something interesting. So I have a CH2, CH3, I have a CH2, CH3, and a CH2, CH3. All right. Even though my branch only has five carbons in its longest path, I'm going to make that my backbone because it gives me two substituents that are simple substituents. One is a ethyl and one is a cyclohexyl. And they're both at the three location. One, two, three. Would have been one, two, three as well. So my full name 
is 3 cyclo hexyl 3 ethyl pentane. All right. Next, got really drawn out, but we're going to do the same type of rules. Um, I'm just going to, since both of these are ethyls, they would tie. I'm going to do the shortest possible path. One, two, three, four, and then five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten to get my full loop around there. This is one, four, diethyl, cyclo, decane. All right, now our rules now covered how we're going to name most of our alkanes. Now, um, we are going to have to introduce a little sub rule that's going to change two of our rules, just add something to them. The first sub rule, our longest continuous chain must actually have the highest priority of functional group. Now, the functional group is an interesting thing. It is something that gives a, uh, a type of chemical reactions to it, and typically, the higher priority function group is going to drive most of the chemical reactions. So we're going to add functional groups on there throughout the semester with organic chem, and it's going to change how we um, do some aspects of the naming. Now, what we mean by priority, certain groups have a little bit more electronegativity and stronger attractions, and they drive the reactions. So what that translates to, if you have a double bond or a triple bond in a molecule with a carbon double bonded to oxygen, the carbon double bonded to oxygen will likely drive most of the reactions. It's not absolute, but that's generally how they got the priorities, is that this guy is a little bit more reactive than the others. Alright, so functional group priority, we have more than just this, because if you look at this table, we don't even have alkanes anywhere on here. This is a very simplified group of the suffixes and how they affect it. We're going to create tables. Now the first table I'm looking at is basically ones that don't change anything of our rules. These guys, we got our alkanes and we've done the alkyl halides. They have that same suffix. We're going to name these as if they are alkanes. These guys all end up as just suffix or prefixes. So we've already done that first one. That's the um, dichloro and we would just number them and call that one, two, dichloro cyclopentane. Now this next one is drawn out to look crazy, but that is a substituent. And if I number the backbone, it's at the 2 location. Now this is just 2 nitro butane. No rules have changed. All right. The last two are interesting because they look a lot more complex, but we're going to find that ethers don't have a lot of priority over this. They're always going to be substituents. So they stay as alkanes. We're going to use the prefix with a number of carbons with the oxy attached. So we have methoxies, ethoxies, and so forth and so on. How we're going to decide to do that, we're going to look at our structure, find the side of the O that has the longest chain, and make that our backbone. On this other one, the backbone is this guy. And the O with the R group is just one slightly larger substituent. Now, on the ethane one, that first one, since it has to be the one location, number one location, because this would, the number in the back of them would just be one, two by default, we don't need to number it. So this going to name this as ethane, so it's going to be eth oxy ethane. Now our last one there, that backbone is pentane, because there's more than one way we could branch off the pentane, we will need the number. So that's two eth eth oxy pentane.
but the two is telling you where it's all at. We haven't changed anything. We just actually just introduced new prefixes. Nitro is one, and then the alk, alk representing our number of carbons, and then the oxy. Right. But we are going to introduce some other functional groups. Now, we're going to not introduce them, they're not ever going to be on the molecule at the same time yet. So if you have any of our other functional groups, they're just going to be higher in priority and they change a few rules. We're just doing this to introduce how it changes certain aspects. So we're only going to introduce four functional groups right now. They are alcohols, amines, alkenes, and alkynes. Now, they do have prefixes, but when we first see these right now, they're going to always change the suffix. So they're going to change what the backbone is. These guys must be part of the backbone. So what does that mean? Well, it only changes how we number it. So when you have uh, one of those higher priority functional groups in there, it gets to get the lowest possible number. So when you go to number the backbone, you're always going to give that higher priority functional group precedence. It gets the lowest number. None of that breaks all these other, other rules. These don't pop up unless this has no influence on the numbering. We're going to see that. I got some examples of it. But we're going to do these backwards. We're going to do our alcohols, then the amines, alkenes, and alkynes. We're going to go down. But we're not going to mix them. So when I first introduce these, we're introducing how we change the suffix. We're going to name it as an alkane, drop the E and put an OL, and we're going to change how we number it. So since this first one, the backbone is definitely right there, carbon, carbon, carbon. It is a propane. Um, that's just how we're going to name it. But when we number it, I want the OH to have the lowest possible number. Giving us a name of 3-bromo. That should be a dash. 1-propanol. Our next one, we have a butane. And numbering here, we're going to do the same thing. I want the OH to have lowest possible number, so I'm going to start numbering at this end. That does put a chlorine at the 4, and numbering from the back other side, we would get lower numbers altogether. But if I started over here, I'd have 1, 2, 3, and I'd have the OH at a 3 location. The OH wants to have the lowest possible number. This is going to be 4 chloro. Oops, not 1, 2 butanol. And our rings introduce a little bit of weirdness. Now, we had those rules before. We always want that shortest possible path. And I know you're thinking this is just going to be 1, 2, 3. Well, that was fine until we put an OH there. Since there is an OH there, the OH is most definitely at the 1 location. 2 is either going to be the chlorine or the methyl. And since C takes precedence, alphabetically, 2, 3, 4, 5. Given us 2 chloro, 5 methyl. And here's something interesting. This looks like I'm leaving a number off, but we're supposed to do this. Oh, that's not propane. Pentanol. When we leave it off, we're implying the OH is at the one position, which is where it's required to be. So we don't number it when it's on that ring. Now I do have a couple weird things we got to add. When we start putting suffixes in here, we're going to see some alternative ways to write that down. It is still propanol, but what we're going to do is propan one all. And up here, four chloro butan two all. Sometimes the number is in front of the prefix it's, it's talking about. Sometimes it's in front of the uh, full backbone name. Both are perfectly acceptable. Okay, when we have two of those functional groups, we're just going to use the um, multiplier prefixes. We're going to follow those same rules, give these the guys the lowest possible numbers. So that means both of those alcohols are at 2 and 4. 
So this is one, or not one, this is two, four, hex and die all. Or hex and two, four, die all. And on our last one, I would number from the top because I get to my first alcohol, the two position. And I have a methyl in the four position, giving me four methyl, two, three, pentan, diol. All right, my next one is the amines. Now, all we're going to do on the name here is we're going to drop the E and put the word amine there. Almost the exact same rules as the alcohol. So, I have my backbone, butane, and I would number it from here because it gets my amine at the lowest possible number. Give me one butan amine. On our next one, I have a branch off of this. I have two sides on the nitrogen. I want the longest chain to be my backbone, but it has to touch where the nitrogen attached. This other thing is going to be a substituent. And numbering wise, one, two, three, or one, two, three, four. I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five, six. So it is a three hexanamine, but the ethyl, this guy, is not off of one of those numbered locations, it's off the nitrogen. So, capital N, ethyl, three, hex, an, amine. The N tells us the ethyl is coming off there. And then our last one, I have three things coming off that nitrogen that are all substituents. I'm going to take the longest and make it the backbone. The other two are going to be just standard substituents. Got an ethyl and a an methyl, and then numbered one, two, and three. So I have an N ethyl, N methyl. Propan amine. All right, our last ones are alkenes and alkynes. Uh, when we have a double bond in there, we're going to replace the E with an E and E. So instead of, or we're replacing the ane part with an E and E. I should say ane. Or we're replacing it for Y and E if it's a triple bond. We're going to number it so it has the lowest possible number for the double bond. And we're going to write down the number it says where the double bond starts. So on this first one, I know I want this to be part of my backbone where that double bond is I could just go up and up wouldn't matter what I did with those other two they're definitely uh, gonna be substituents and they are just methyls so I have here two three dimethyl now is a butene but I want to have a two to tell you the double bond starts at the two position and just like with the alcohols, that could have been 2,3-dimethyl-butuene. Two now the middle one's interesting. So the cyclohexene must be the backbone. The ring has to be the backbone because it has that double bond. And the double bond definitely is carbons 1 and 2. Wow. You could number either way. Uh, the bottom one could be one, or the top one could be one, but the other one has to be two. And since there's two possibilities, I look at the next branch. 
Since this location also has a substituent, it must be number 1. 2, 3, 4, 5, makes this at 6. So I have a methyl and I have a chloro. So I have 1 chloro, 6 methyl, cyclohexene. No need to be numbered since it's part of the ring. The double bond must start at the number one location. And then our last one is an alkyne, has a triple bond in it. These can be somewhat misleading how they get numbered because that where that three lines ends, that is supposed to be a bond or another carbon. So this is four carbons. And I numbered at the bottom because I gave the triple bond the lowest possible number, given us one but all right. Got one other thing I want to introduce on double bonds. Now, it kind of applies here in the sense that this double bond can't rotate, um, but it also gets ignored because it's part of a ring. But sometimes it's kind of important to see how it's shaped. So what I mean by it's shaped, I want you to notice this guy. Since this double bond can't rotate, that molecule and this molecule are two different things. That extra carbon can't rotate. They're both two butenes, but since it can't rotate, these are two different butenes. Now, it's actually relatively straightforward how we're going to distinguish them. We're going to always at first just look at what the backbone does, and since this backbone does this a zigzag, we call that trans. And since this one, uh, the two sides are on the same side, we call this cis. Now the cis and trans will apply to the backbone, not necessarily our branches, but it still helps us identify these next two. So our double bond must be part of the backbone. And I'm just going to go here to make this a long continuous chain. When I number it, I want to the... the um, Excuse me, I want the double bond to have the slowest possible number, so I'm going to start numbering over here. I have a methyl substituent and I have a chloro substituent. I'm going to put the chloro first. So, without identifying the backbone, I have two chloro, four methyl, two pentene. But since this double bond can rotate, I have these the backbone going on the same side. This is a cis to chloro for methyl to pentane. All right, next one's interesting. Did this on purpose, but I have the double bond, and I definitely want to go that way to get longer. But on this other side, I could go up or down. It really doesn't matter. All right, because. The other side just gets to be substituents. And I can number it pretty much the same way. Get the double bond, the slowest possible number. So I have two substituents. 2, 4, dimethyl. 2, pentene. And at least it looks like I drew this as if it's cis. But these two guys are the exact same thing. They are both CH3s. It wouldn't matter if I flipped them, and therefore it won't matter what the backbone is. I could have actually drawn that as a trans double bond, and it still would have been the same uh, name. So since flipping those two do, does not create a, a, a different molecule, I don't put the cis and trans on this one. Now in a couple chapters we're going to look into this a little bit more, uh, because when we start to put more than one double bond on a uh, structure, uh, we have to actually name it slightly different. We can't have a cis-cis mole molecular formula. We're going to introduce a new naming scheme that just centers on double bonds. All right, but that introduces some of our coming attractions. So uh, we are definitely getting a lot more functional groups. Um, if I back up to that slide where I summarize these, we got these covered and got these covered, but I didn't talk anything at all about these yet. We're going to see there's a lot of carbon double bond oxygen functional groups alone. 
this table gets a lot taller. Um, the asymmetrical centers are coming up. That's kind of what I talked about with the double bonds. When there's more than one in a, in a structure, we have to name them differently. We're also going to see that carbons with their four bonds can be arranged different ways in space and create what we call asymmetrical carbons. And then we are going to introduce the concept of putting more than one functional group in there. So alcohols with alkenes and how we go about naming those. So we're not done with nomenclature at, at all, um, but we will be adding to it as we add more functional groups to our uh, knowledge base.